Jennifer Zapparelli on 2FM. Good morning, everyone. How's it going? It is Tuesday, the 7th of March. Can't believe, can't believe they're saying this. It's all over the papers because we love talking about the weather. And now I'm going to talk about it. Snow and icy conditions are on the way, lads. Like, what? No. Just about to finish Dance with the Stars and emerge from the darkness of winter. Why, Miss Erin? Why would you say this? So a nationwide status yellow weather warning was in place from yesterday, 6 p.m. and is actually expected to last well until uh, next week. Frosty conditions, they say. Well into next week. Met Erin, you can cop yourself on now. <sighs> and while you put your summer clothes back in the press, listen to this. On the show today, we'll keep you warm and toasty. Oh, we will. We have a good friend of the show, Dr. Neve Shaw. She's going to be in talking about the Irish women going into space. You can win an iPhone on today's show with thanks to On Post, which is deadly. We will have a regional roundup with one of our correspondents around the country and Connor and Cormac are going to be in for newsy bits. We're going to be talking pretty privilege. We're going to be talking slogan tease, getting out of hand and much, much more. Don't go anywhere. Text Jen 51552. Oh. is right. Yes, welcome to Jen's Newsy Bits. We are bringing you the stories of the day. We have trawled the internet and the papers this morning and we've picked our favourite stories to talk about. Uh, and we want to talk to you about And in studio, I have Connor Bean and Cormac Battle. Hello. Hello, everybody. Good hello, morning. Hello, hello. Good morning. Okay, uh, you want to kick off yeah. with some... 
Cormac, it's so funny. I've been wanting to talk about this for so long. Somebody <laughs> said it to me, one of my pals, and I thought, oh, that is so good. We need to talk about this. This particular phenomenon. Okay, let's set it up then. Smiling in a job application photo or at an interview could help job seekers secure the position, research has found. That's smiling. Smiles indicate confidence and applicants' desire to please while also making them appear attractive. Attractiveness or... Uh, calls pretty girl privilege. There it is. There you go. Pretty girl. <laughs> got, got it out. That Ooh, one. There got it, it is. Out. Pretty girl <laughs> privilege has been established by numerous um, studies as beneficial as people are found to warm to good-looking individuals. And there's experiments to say that um, you know people are attracted towards pretty people, and especially in the job market and all 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 other walks of life. Um, uh, so, but some find that serious expressions can make people seem more professional. But the pretty privilege, pr- pretty girl privilege thing seems to go a long way. If you're willing to be that type of person, engage in that kind of thing. Um, do you pretty girl privilege, Jen? Do, do you believe do you in pretty girl? I believe, I don't have it, but I'm, I'm working on it. I love how you're like trying to imply, I, who am not good looking at all. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I throw a lot of money at the problem <laughs> to get to be a pretty girl, to be honest with you. But I worked in sales for years and it's so interesting because I manage loads of sales teams, right? And it's so funny that the, the pretty... The pr- there you go. <laughs> do not count to me. The pretty girls. The pretty girls would always do a lot better. That's just a fact. Yeah, that, it, it was, yes, people would stop for them and they'd be less threatened by them for some reason. And the people who were the, the, the pretty girls would be able to, you know, get people to stop, get them to buy off them a lot easier than someone else. It kind of makes logical but it's, sense. I, I think it's pretty person privilege. I think, I think it's pretty that, girl. Yeah, I've heard of pretty privilege years and I have pretty privilege, I should say, and I've always felt that it is it's a kind of currency it's a tool that like and it's like a lot of privileges people have it's a part it's kind of a reality and i don't it can be annoying but i hate when people downplay when people who are good looking regardless of the gender are like what do you mean i'm like no the fact that you're good looking absolutely helps you in x or y or it is from social settings to like certain professional settings it can be a way to lower defenses get someone on side or even as you're saying in the case of the sales teams like get someone to stop and just engage with you like yes. and it plays off of kind of i don't want to say a base instinct in a bad way but like just a response we have to pretty things in general think of like dogs if you see someone out walking a dog and the dog is cute you're likely to stop and maybe even talk to the owner or just be like oh my god that is the cutest dog ever. whereas the dog is rotten you're not going to be like I need oh, to no, bet that dog no no I don't know we spoke no. about three legged dogs last week <laughs> but you're all over yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like pretty, an ugly though. dog it's going to be a cute dog with three legs I'm talking about the dog face and the dog eyes mm. yeah but uh, I mean uh, but I'm into, I find pretty people quite intimidating sometimes as well like someone's just gobsmackingly beautiful it's just like <laughs> I, I retreat because it's just too much me to cope with um like you i've been in job interviews um many unsuccessful job interviews in my life and uh, you go into kind of you know the the waiting area and you see some lad there and he's you know don draper from mad men he, you know he's a chiseled face he's 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 six foot four and you're just you feel like just getting up and walking out because <laughs> you know even if this guy hasn't got a clue what he's talking about he is going to get the gig and you are not going to get the gig you're Why the, is it? Because you're the runt in the room. Cormac, you're not a runt. But John, just, I'm just, you know what I mean? If John Draper, if John Hamm walks Look, in, we're all Yeah, a bit that's screwed. it. Yeah, that, 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 that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Why do lads always size each other up? Like, you never hear, um, you never hear a girl, really, or a female, or whatever you identify as, going, oh, that girl. Oh, 5'11". You know, really brown hair. <laughs> I, I think you never do that. What is that in lads? Is that some kind of? I think it's a it's an old caveman vibe. It's like yeah. circling each other, like yeah, size each other. Like you know, yeah. could I take this dude if he jumped on top of me now? Could I take him? And yeah. you're worried because this guy would be be able to take you. And also, if um, you'd be. He, you know, he's going to get all the attention if, um, so, you know, for me, uh, if women come into the room, he's going to get all the attention. I'm not going to get any. So you, you've got all that. I remember that actually growing up. I used to, it was a real pain, like, hanging out with really pretty boys because you'd be like, oh, you're talking to... Um, maybe I was talking to a girl and this guy had come into the... Into the uh, in, into the orbit of the conversation. And you just know, ah, that's that then. You know, he's here. It's all over. Yeah. I will say, though, as a kind of a counter, and this happens in a lot of settings, romantic, professional, otherwise, sometimes as well, 
there are people who are good looking and that has allowed them to either coast a little bit or yes. certain doors have opened because of their looks and sometimes, not always obviously, they don't kind of have the follow through. It's kind of that cliche of your friend will say, I got with the hottest person in the world recently and they were terrible in bed. Oh my or they God, were a crap yes. boyfriend. They didn't text back because they are used to coasting. things going their way they're because coasting. they're good looking. You're now, so right. Now, Is that not something, not Connor, we like to say to ourselves to make us feel <laughs> yeah, better about it? You don't happen. want them to be good looking men and good you know looking men. Very leveler? good in bed as well. I have seen so, when I'm DJing, I have seen so many good looking people of every description, walk of life you can think of. They get on the dance floor and they can't dance, but because they're good looking, they think they're amazing. And you're like, you're awful, but no one's ever told you you can't dance. It's fascinating. I'm like, whoa, you look like a supermodel. Then you started moving the dance floor. I want to die inside. There is advantages to hanging out with pretty people. Yes. You get the dregs. Yeah. You do. You get the crumbs from the table. Lau had this extremely... uh, Johnny, uh, Lau, if you're listening, was it Johnny, your mate? Johnny was (laughs) his mate. Absolute... Beautiful. I was human. loving you here, hearing you say that. <laughs> he's a beautiful human being. He's married now with four kids, whatever. But back in the day in school, he got all the ladies, and I was like, I didn't care. I got, I got the dress. <laughs> <laughs> no, or, or the <laughs> friend or whatever. A oh uh, pretty girl. Here's a couple of texts coming in already, lads. A uh, pretty girl is one hundred percent a thing. This texter says, by no means am I stunning, but I always carry a large smile, and I get away with absolute murder. I'm cheeky and confident, and has got me where I am today. I've uh, quite a, a large job on the back of spoofing and pretty girl vibes. Did, Did you yeah. write that yourself, Jen? No! How dare you? <laughs> we all sorry. Thing. We're in a very visual <laughs> culture now because of Instagram yeah. and TikTok and how social media has even moved away from text to video in a lot of ways. Like, people who know how to present themselves even if they're not quote unquote good looking but smile and know how to turn it on there is something to be said for that as a skill and in some ways I don't knock someone who can use it but it is frustrating sometimes that like what well, is something maybe out of your control your looks or how you how you present to people to a degree can go against you as well I suppose in a professional setting and that kind of stuff it is I mean especially just going back to sales the first thing we would do we would say to them you got it if you want to make if you want to make like 500 quid, you got to look like, you got to look like, more, you got to look well. You yeah. got to dress sharp. Yeah. You got to dress like you mean it. You know what I mean? So dre- there's no shame in wanting to look your best and doing the best with what you have. Mm-hmm. There's no shame. And that's why in interviews, it's so important to look smart, dress, and you feel a bit more confident as well. Um, but I love the fact they said pe- pretty people can be coasting. Yes. That is so true. Get away with murder. Totally like, true. Like, like, <laughs> literally. They Ted they Bundy. Can, they can they, get away with murder. Literally, <laughs> they get away with murder because we were talking about a stat in America. What was it, Cormac? Last week, we were talking about that mad stat about uh, pretty people in America are less likely to get yeah, yeah, to convicted. Like, less likely to get charged or yeah. convicted of crimes. But also, you know, uh, you, you know, people who are not pretty let's say have to work uh, harder have to, you, you yeah. know you have to develop a, a really you know strong sense of humour to yep. compete with the with the chisel jawed you know rugby player beside you who can be really dull oh. but he's still going to win at the so end of the dull. night but then he's still going to yeah. win you can be funny yeah. as you want and brilliant personality but at the end of the night she's you not going to sleep with you you know the game you know you, 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 like we're really digging won. into your t- teenagers Already. in a very specific way here. <laughs> the chisel rugby player I believe his name is John he lived yeah. on uh, 575 yeah. Yeah. I did say uh, uh, lads are the only, you know, uh, the only ones that size each other up. Uh, that is not true. Uh, and according to this text, and they're absolutely right, girls do it in a weight sizing rather than a height sizing. Yeah, which is slightly depressing, but yes, Awful. I know what you mean. Uh, girls yeah. will say, oh, she's a size X in comparison. Yeah. Mm, that's true. I can't do anything about my height, you know, and uh, beyond wearing platform shoes. You do a bono, yeah. Yeah, but that's... <laughs> But that's, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> you know, I, 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 it's, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I would imagine in a woman's world, in the pretty girl privilege, it's a lot more um, nuanced and, I don't know, darker, I would say. Darker? Yeah, I would wow. say it's darker. There's, and blokes yeah. are a bit more kind of, oh, come on, Jesus Christ, man, you're so good looking, it's really annoying. Yeah. But I'd say girls, oh, there's yeah. also a societal... I'll take ex- you down. There's expectations on women, like a societal thing, of they ha- like, you know, looking a certain way is like, it has more to it than just, with lads, it's a bit of like, ah, sure, you know, I'll look past that. With women, there is still, I think, in certain settings, a sense that how you look has too much value as well. Yeah. Like, you know, you're all, it's the first thing people expect versus maybe your talent or your head or your brain or whatever. Who are the 
the boffins that do this study? This is what I'm wondering. Who walks into a meeting room or a lab or whatever? These, this, and goes, we're going to conduct a study on pretty girl privilege. Okay, mm. just get all the pretty girls in a room for me <laughs> and let me have a chat with them. Um, listen, you can text me if you like, 51552. A pretty girl privilege. What do you think? Who is the pretty girl in your group and does she get away with absolute murder? <laughs> Strolling in the park, watching when I turn to spring. Walking in the dark, seeing lovers do their thing. Ooh, that's the time. I feel like me. Welcome back to Jen's Newsy Bits. It is 9.21. I'm here with Connor and Cormac discussing the stories of the day. Good morning. Good morning, Jen. Okay, morning. this is interesting. It's come from the UK, but I wanted to talk about it because um, I don't know if this is something that should be part of the curriculum, and I want to talk to you guys yeah. about it. So on average, 111 school children lose a parent every day in the UK. Not a frightening stat. Wow. Schools have no formal education on grief and bereavement at the moment. Now, John Adams is president of the National Association of Funeral Directors and thousands of others believe more needs to be done to help children prepare for the death of a loved one before it happens, which is why he's leading this huge campaign to add bereavement to the national curriculum. OK, more than 10,000 people have signed John's online petition calling for age appropriate education on bereavement. Now, every 22 minutes in the UK, a parent will die. I know this is a bit grim, but it needs to be mm. ta- spoken about. And 80 percent of people will suffer a close loss by the age of 18. OK, so we know death is it's a part of life, uh, but talking about death can be helpful. We know that for children and issues of bereavement should be compulsory learning for children in preparation for life as an adult, John believes. What do you guys think? I think when um, people read these stats, you know, 80% of people will suffer a close loss by the age of 18. Okay, they're in their school years. Oh, the school should do something about it. The school. Yeah. <laughs> like, let them yeah. let them do the bereavement counselling. 
you know, let them take it. Yeah, sex education, let them do it. Yeah. You know, I, I really feel this is something... I kind of, I really do feel that this is something the family should take responsibility for. Um, it certainly would help to have bereavement uh, as part of the national curriculum, but I think as family members, as aunties, as sisters, as friends, as as mothers and fathers, we should be able to talk about it or start the conversation. Maybe bre- it's like a bit like, I mean, most parents now go, when do we start to mention sex relationships with our kids on age appropriate levels as they grow up and when do we start you know like is there a way to bring but I think, death into the conversation but I, think children, I don't know but like, uh, so I think sex is kind of a different thing because children and we all experience death from yeah. a very 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 young age it might not be the death, the death of a close one or a um, a family member you're dealing with the death of animals you're dealing with the death of insects you're dealing with the death of lots of things as a child like my, my kids um, are 9 and 11 two boys and you know death is part of, of, of conversations all the time it's mm. not necessarily in the, in the context of a death of a, of a young one by any means but they're aware of death they're they 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 they, 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 they feel like it doesn't it's nothing to do with them obviously because you know it's an abstract kind of idea. Do so you think you can them. never prepare a child for a bereavement? I don't know. Um, well, like I think I think through our just general conversations that we we talk about it anyway, and you know nothing can really prepare you for the death of a of a of, a, of, a, of someone close to you. O- only only that experience. I is never so, forget I being a child. Okay, I didn't experience death in the family till my granny died and I was probably uh, 12 or 13, but I remember re- being really young and playing in a field with my pals and we found a dead mouse. Right. God, thank God. I thought there was going to be yeah, somewhere yeah, else. There was a big I thought I was going to go face. stand by me. For no, me. No, I was like, was whoa, whoa, whoa. We found a dead mouse <laughs> and the, just, I was so fascinated by this. But we um, made it a little coffin. We made oh. a little, uh, we put, bought, made flowers. Mm. We hold hand, held hands. We did a little ceremony for it. And just, you know, that I remember that it, my first experience of seeing anything dead or real. Well, we didn't want that, to do this. We, we, fi- we figured out we wanted to yeah. do this kind of ritual. Years later, years, 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 years later, I was at a wake and a family member had their kids there running around the coffin. Uh, and the person who had recently deceased was very close to these children uh, running around the coffin. But they were so, um, it was so normal. And, you know, it, they weren't shunned away. They weren't put away in another room because at the end of the day, they're going to see their parents grieve and not understand what the hell is going on. So I think, like, years ago in Ireland, children were always part of of funerals and wakes and always running around because there's nowhere else to go, and they were always there. Mm. Uh, And I think we have gotten to a stage where we're trying to overprotect our children from death and from you know the the hardship of it and the misery of it and you know it's it's uncomfortable and we don't want to be uncomfortable yeah, with their reaction as adults we're uncomfortable with the whole but, yeah. anyway. but then being in, yeah. part of it surely is helpful because they're going to experience it we don't have to read that stat again that 80% of people will suffer a close loss by the age of 18 but if we normalise death and death is a part of life yes it's hard yes it's extremely emotionally uh, you know upsetting and soul destroying and it can be awful but I think that's the way I think it's facing it head on you know and not shying away from wakes and funerals and talking about it and crying in front of our kids yeah, um, I can imagine a lot of kids, but, but I would think about it myself. Like if I if I had to go to a funeral, which was going to be, um, you know, particularly sad, tragic, yeah. that I would certainly think twice about bringing my kids to it, um, for better or for worse. That's just the my honest feelings about it. Um, I could say, yeah, bring them along because you know they need to confront these things. This is, life is a very big part of death, and it's ultimately going to get us all at one point, and they need to face up to this but I don't know if, if that was a, a situation like that I might um, think I'd, I think I'd prefer to leave them at home rather than bring them to an experience which is going to be extremely harrowing and mm. experiences they will encounter as they get older and I'm, have maybe the tools to deal that, with that a little the bit better vocabulary when you're older yeah. um, I'm yeah. not sure but like compulsory teaching of um, for issues around bereavement 
uh, in school, I'm not sure about it. Well, I suppose it depends on how it's taught. Yeah, the tone you know. of it and stuff. Yeah. Do you yeah. remember uh, your first experience with death as a kid and, and how it was dealt with? See, I had a... I had a granny die when I was very young to the point where I don't really remember much about it because I was too young to really take it in. And then I had a granddad on the other side of my family die in the last kind of four or five years when I obviously was an adult. And actually, it has been one of those things where, I mean, as an adult, I know death is a part of life. I've I'd been to the funeral of a friend who was killed, you know, in a bombing in Manchester. So I'm very aware that people my age can die. But there was something about experiencing that kind of funeral of, you know, a grandparent that really did, you know, seeing the generations of a family from both sides, people who've travelled over for it, etc. That did kind of, it made you think about it. And, you know, we had the body in the home before the funeral and stuff. And that was my first time actually seeing a body like that. And that was a surreal thing to think. I'm like, at that point, I was like, late 20s, early 30s, thinking, God, like, this is so, and there was much, you know, there was other yeah. grandkids that were younger than me seeing it. And I was like, we're all having very different experiences of this, even though we're all different ages. So, well, you're all together. And I think, yeah, the ritual need, of it is, is helpful. Yeah. The ritual is helpful. That's why we do them. And I think kids need to grieve as well. That's why I was so adamant to bring my kids to Lau's Nan's funeral. She was a huge part of her. You've heard, even heard me talk about mm. the nonna who was like, yeah. you know, 96 on the show. And when she died, I was adamant to bring them because she was so much part of their life they i felt that they deserved to be part of that ritual as well yeah took them to the grave and they threw a rose in and all that and they felt very much part of it you know witnessing leo break down and crying i thought that's all very important for their emotional development to experience that yeah. as well and and be able to just be together and comfort each other and being part of the ritual i think was i think was helpful i really really do instead of me explaining it's, and it feels abstract, as you said earlier. Like, it's an abstraction when you as a parent try to go, and when blah, blah, blah happens, that means, whereas if they're there and they see it, they may not get every single detail. Mm. But kids have good instincts. And I think trusting someone's emotional instincts and their intuition, even as a child, is a useful thing. Do you think it depends on the, the person then, or the or the kid, you know, whether they're going to be emotionally able Possibly. to handle it. Yeah. And it's the context. And it's funny because actually, before you brought up the fact that that was Lao's grandmother, and that's, you know, an Italian kind of culture, the way, as in, I was actually yeah. thinking when we started this about how in Italy there is a culture around a certain amount of grieving time and in Ireland we have traditions around wakes and, and memorials whereas I remember I had a friend years ago who was going out with someone from the UK and the person in the UK had a, a bereavement and they travelled over to the funeral and she just was remarking on it how it moved so much faster over there. Oh yeah. It was a cremation and yeah. the ceremony all happened within a certain span of time and in one way she's like you know in some ways it meant that we didn't dwell, but in other ways, I wonder, was it too... And there's no right or wrong, but it's interesting we're reading stats in the UK because I think even in the UK, of course, they do it differently to how we do it. So, and taking religion out of it, I think ritual and having some kind of this is how we're going to try and just actually acknowledge this is a useful... Maybe that's something families do go, A, make grief a, a conversation that comes up in a normal way, but also go, were it to happen, maybe, what are things we could maybe have in place? Like, yeah. would we all go to a certain place to remember them or something like that? Here, This is an interesting point, and this is where a bereavement on the national curriculum might better prepare yeah. people. Um, somebody texted and said, I remember when my mom died and I was just 16. I wish someone had told me that when I touched her to kiss her, she would be so cold. To this yeah. day, it still haunts me. Mm. You know? Yeah. They're going to, you know... That's understandable. They're going to look different. They're going to feel different. They're not... You know that's what I mean? All that. That's the thing about the body being laid out. It, it's slightly... There's an uncanny valley quality to it. That's a bit... In a way, you're like, I can see you and I can take this in, but also... It isn't them because you know it's a date. They've mm-hmm. been made up, and they're be, like it's Absolutely. a whole. It's a surreal thing. I'd love to know what you guys think. Did you have to deal with death at a, a very young age, and, and could anything have prepared you for it? Uh, you know, if it was on the curriculum, would that have better prepared you? Uh, you know, your your parents taking you to a wake or sitting you down or having that conversation. Yeah. I'd love to hear from you on this five one five five two. You can also WhatsApp us oh eight seven one eight seven nine two hundred. We'll take a quick break. And we'll be right back.
The music event of the year. We're live from Vicker Street for RTE Choice Music Prize with performances from Pillow Queens, Anna Meek, Aoife Nessa Francis, Just Mustard and Thumper. Come celebrate the very best in Irish music right here. The sound of the nation. RTE Choice Music Prize. Thursday, March 9th at 7pm on 2FM. Jen Zapparelli on 2FM. Another witness brought to the stand To prove a nightmare has the upper hand The jury's out and you won't look within But soon you'll find out that we both couldn't win And will they plead forgiveness For this courtroom head trip Pull me out of this pathology Where love comes with an apology You're a leader of men you despise Caught in your lies Pull me out of this pathology Another victim Loyal to your cause But would they ever Dare to think or pause The judge is laughing Because it's true The only one You are fooling is you And will they plead forgiveness Bits where we bring you the big stories of the day, tell you what's going on in the world. I've Cormac and Connor in studio. Now, we're going to take a little sidestep for a second. Thank you so much for your text messages into 51552. I will get to them in a second. But Connor wants to talk about yes. slogan, slogan teas. <laughs> I have, this is close to my heart because I love a pop music tea, a concert tea, mm-hmm. I'll have you. So this really spoke to me. Uh, the Guardian was talking about this. They're saying how Gen Z are very into their slogan teas. They said that phrases like no problem or everyone now on t-shirts from everyone in the creative world to celebrities as well. Of course, on telly, we've seen like Porsche in the White Lotus and her kind of slogan teas and what they say about her as a character. In real life, you've got Man City striker Erling Harland and actor Taylor Russell, who's in Bones and all. They've been wearing them also. One that went very viral last year, particularly among her fan base, was uh, pop star Charlie XCX, who wore a t-shirt just after her album came out, saying they don't build statues of critics. And when she didn't win any of the Brit Awards this year, she was also spotted in a t-shirt that said, real winner. Yeah. When we had the Nepo Baby conversation go from TikTok to New York Magazine to everywhere else, Hayley Bieber was recently spotted in one that said, Nepo Baby. Lady Rodrigo wore God's favourite Julia Fox who's 
boyfriends and love life were as famous as her wore one that said star effort which is like a, an old school term that people still use and then online you know the slogan to you whether they're throwbacks or mentioning current trends have just never gone away. One I was mentioning earlier is Britney Spears in the 2000s wore one that said dump him after her breakup with Justin yes! Timberlake. And that oh, one, iconic, that Connor. Dump, that dump him tea is a meme and a term. Pe- like even like young people use online now. Young people, I sound like, I sound extremely out of touch when I say that, but there's these ones that have become kind of like, a, they're kind of a way of, they're like a signifier, a way of letting people know I'm in on the joke or this is what I'm communicating with the world today with what I'm wearing. So, so you're all good? for them. I'm all for it, but has it gone too far is it gas is it actually going back to t-shirts like choose life or you know Italians do it better is this the oldest trick in the book and they'll never go away I don't think they're ever going to go away yeah I don't think they're ever going away sure Graham wore one the other week what was it be happy or you're amazing or what was it you make me happy Graham <laughs> I don't know it was something <laughs> it was something outside. Graham what was the slogan t-shirt you wore um, the happy one or you're deadly this morning is amazing and so oh. are you. See? But you could wear that ironically as well because I actually... Excuse me! Well, no, I, you can see you see people wear slogan tees and band tees around. I remember once years ago I was outside the button factory after some like dance music gig and there was a guy in like a Taylor Swift t-shirt but it was like so obvious he was wearing it for the laugh whereas I was like well I would unironically wear a Madonna t-shirt to the club so you and I are not the same. <laughs> you know? And I think with slogan tees there can be a bit of a wink and a nod even with Charlie XCX she's kind of like just, she's kind of saying, I'll go to the workshop, but I don't necessarily need it. She's not taking it super seriously. There's okay. a wink to it. Okay. Yeah, have I, they always been like, when you were a rock star? Was there... it, yeah. yeah. I, like, I, when, when I was doing the whole band thing, and I was like, oh, like everybody at, at the time, it was like, I'm so anti-corporate. I, I hate corporations taking over the world. Capitalism is yeah, wrong, man. man. Yeah, man. Yeah. I hate capitalism. So I had this T-shirt that said, just said, eat the rich on it. Thinking about it now... But I used to wear that and think I was cool. I mean, seriously. I'd cringe. I'd probably wear it. Right now. I'd wear it. I'd say lightly season the rich. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, there was, it, I just thought I was so cool as well. And I look at I feel myself going red thinking about wearing that stupid t shirt. I probably did, yeah. I mean, that's even worse, isn't it? But then, yeah. for but the like, storytelling you, know, you did as a, as a performer, as an artist, it was part of your story, and the art. And you might cringe at it now, but like, oh, as a as a rock star, that's what you were doing to let signify to the audience: this is the but point I'm of view t- of me as a performer. This is who I am. Whether you've changed, now, I was a total course. hypocrite, though. I didn't believe yeah. anything about what. But I was even saying that is part of the art too. I know, I know, but like, it was what? just an image I was trying to put yeah. out there about myself, which wasn't true at all. Eat the rich. I didn't give a crap about corporate culture or capitalism. I was just. <laughs> trying to be cool. You're like, Karl Marx, um, is he not, is he not the opening act tonight? <laughs> I'm not, I work for a corporation right now. Well, you I'm do now. Well, this, that but, was the future. But Little like, did you know, know be back careful then. what you wear when you're, you know, really? when you're doing that because you will come, a lot of them you will come to regret. I guarantee you there's loads of people out there who have worn t-shirts in the past and they go, oh my God. And I thought it was so cool wearing them t-shirts. Um, I don't think the, I've ever but, worn a slogan t-shirt. Really? But, no. Don't this think I've ever We need it. you in one this weekend and dancing now. We have to get you a slogan. Do you remember I got a vasectomy, Jane? Yeah. I got a vasectomy a few years ago, right? Went out on his yeah. lunch, you got it. Yeah. I did. <laughs> you know, I did. Just take it off the list. I did. <laughs> yeah, get just on your lunch break. Get lunchtime one, yeah. yeah. You know, get a taxi home. Why not? Or, or whatever. But anyway, treat yourself. I was getting... <laughs> I was getting a... I got a bus home after it, actually, oh, Connor. Wow. A bus home. A and they were all around the place. And it wasn't great. I'm telling you that now. Especially on the top deck. But... I got a T-shirt afterwards given to me by Susie, um, who, who was on the show for a long time. And uh, it said, um, it was a, a celebration of my uh, procedure and it said, all juice, no seeds. <laughs> so that's what I was. I, and I still am, all juice and Susie no seeds. Susie isn't with us anymore because she's uh, writing slogans <laughs> for T-shirts. Oh, slogans for that T-shirts. T-shirts. That, one, that one was good because it was actually funny. And I wasn't but you trying didn't to, wear it. I, was, I did wear it once. Where? And, uh, I wore it once when she was around at, at a party thing. Yeah. I, did, I don't wear it a lot, to be honest. Yeah, it's a conversation starter, though. But that's also what I kind of like about the slogan tea. It can have... It can, have a, it can be, if you know what this what this represents or means, and you and I speak the same language and we might connect or be friends, and then we mention the visual culture we live in now in the Instagram, TikTok era, 
they are quick ways to grab attention or to connect to an existing culture or say, I get the reference. Even like, you know, Hayley Bieber wearing a Nepo baby t-shirt. I was actually chatting to a friend about this the other week and we were saying, to us, Hayley Bieber is so granola bar and vanilla that like that's not actually a sleigh as the kids would say because she's bland. Whereas if other celebs who have a bit of for as well to free we'd be like that's gas they did that so again it depends on the person it's me tone, and Cormac are looking at you going I think you're thinking the same as me <laughs> Can you explain what a Nepo baby is? Oh, yeah. I, I, no, no. <laughs> I thought maybe you talked about this on the show. Sorry. No, no, we have. We, have, we, we did talk about <laughs> Nepo babies. We, Jen, you can't drag me down your road with you. I know exactly what a Nepo He's up to date. He a reads Nepo New York baby magazine. Is somebody what? who gets a job because of nepotism. Am I not right? Well, somebody like, uh, who's, who's Goldie Hawn's daughter? What's her name? Kate Hudson. Kate She's an Hudson. amazing actress. She, Don't bring her into this generation. Is she a Nepo but baby? This is the conversation about Nepo babies. It's not. It started out as a sort of jokey tongue-in-cheek thing on TikTok. It'll be you know. embarrassing in 10 years' time, I guarantee well, you. Well, it, the thing about it is it, it's it's a slangy kind of way people are talking about something that has existed in Hollywood for de- for yeah. centuries, and it's actually not necessarily, ne- not necessarily a bad thing all the time. I think it was just for a lot of, like, TikTokers who were quite young, like, Gen Zers were kind of saying, did you know that Blas dies, blah? And most people were like, yes, because I'm of an age or that's relevant. I've seen that happen, whereas people were discovering things like Kate Hudson and Goldie Hawn because it was new to them. So there was a kind of a tongue-in-cheek element, and then when it got reported on it became this never ending discourse and all the celeb Nepo babies got really defensive and we're like Jamie Lee Curtis you're cool we like you anyway Drew Barrymore it's fine you like it became a kind of a funny thing and also there's a generation now of there's tiers of celebrity now where like it's kind of their only defining feature versus oh yeah like their dad's famous but also as you mentioned Kate Hudson very talented like there's a string where you're like I feel like the celeb connections you're only really in here like wasn't really the time per se you you were um a lot. You're always yes. wearing T-shirts, yeah, yeah. you know, with, with bands or, mm-hmm. or pop stars and so yeah. on on them. Like um, like Madonna is yeah. one. I'm wearing I a Juno Birch T-shirt today. And what, you, what, what are the other ones that you wear? Because you're always wearing them. And uh, yeah, I mean, what's, it's in usually... your, what's in your kind of wardrobe of, 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 of <laughs> pop star almost, T-shirts? It's usually merch from gigs. Sometimes the stuff I'm in send. Sometimes it's drag performers. Mm. For me, it's start because I'm DJing. It's a handy kind of a kind of. Do you uniform. wear them ironically? Somewhere. No, not no, at all. He actually, loves Madonna. No, no, I know Madonna. Yeah, he said that. About no, Madonna. Britney. Some he's of the, Britney. His some share. of the other ones. You wear a lot of Britney ones. ones. But is, actually, that, is it ironic? Or no, is and, it straight up like? No, that's interesting you ask that because for me it isn't, and it's funny because I and like that as a conversation because I actually remember years ago upstairs someone tried to make a smart comment about the fact that I was wearing a Madonna t-shirt and I just said to them well I'm not the one wearing leather waistcoat in 22 degree weather and they just looked at me and I went don't try me this is not a joke like I don't do this for fun you know as in like I like that it's a conversation yeah. starter and particularly when you're DJing it's fun to have music on your body because you're in a nightclub Absolutely. and that's what you're doing but yeah. Can, I, can I just go back to pretty privilege? We were talking about pretty yes. privilege uh, earlier on and the fact that attractiveness or pretty girl privilege has been established by num- numerous previous studies as beneficial. Benefit, it's, lads, we, it's beneficial to be pretty. You don't need studies to tell us Absolutely, yeah, you're wasting taxpayers' money. You don't need studies. We all <laughs> know this to you. You. <laughs> uh, I was talking about working in sales and you'd always put the uh, pretty people... Um, you know, out on the field because they get people to stop and they do yeah. way better. Hi, Jan. Back in the early noughties, I worked on a sales team. There was a gorgeous blonde there who was very successful. Anyway, she changed her hair colour to brown and her sales manager went bananas <laughs> because she was so her selling successful. Points in his head. I thought you were going to finish that sentence and say she, they, they went bananas and told her to dye her hair blonde again. They probably did. They, they probably it, did. If she was on my, my team, she'd be like, I'd be like, get into that, please. You had on a wig until it grows out. <laughs> <laughs> lads, if you'd like to get in touch with the show, it's 51552. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, lads. RTE.
God's winds direction A simple revelation I'm stuck in rotation Can't seem to escape it But I run to the edges And find a new sensation A whirlwind I'm spinning Hoping that I'll make it As I hold my Kaki kids. Now it is 9.49. We're talking about this um, in the UK. Uh, where's it gone? Uh, yes, listen to this. Um, John Adams is the president of a, a National Association of Funeral Directors and thousands of others. They believe more needs to be done to help children prepare for death of loved ones before it happens, which is why he's leading this huge campaign to add bereavement to the national curriculum. We're having a conversation this morning about can you ever really prepare a child for the loss of a loved one. Lorraine is on the line. Hi, Lorraine. Hi, Jen. How are you? I'm really good, really good. So what's your take on this? Um, I just know from my own school, um, my daughter, two daughters in primary school, and my eldest daughter has a friend whose uncle passed away last year. Mm-hmm. And her mother was telling me that the principal has started taking a few of the children out of class and doing bereavement counselling with them. Okay. Um Personally, I had um, my aunt passed away before Christmas and my, I brought my daughter to the funeral. She's only five, no, the youngest one. Yeah. I didn't think anything of it at the time bringing her, but for, I don't know how many nights afterwards, bringing her to bed, she was all questions. Where had she gone? What did she do in heaven? And, you know, it's just, yeah. I didn't have the answers for her. <laughs> yeah. No. 
And I just think, yeah, maybe it is a good idea to bring it into schools and, okay. and prepare them. Okay. Um, isn't it great that she had those questions, though, and she could go to you? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, like, I even... When my husband's grandmother passed away uh, a week after my aunt, <laughs> mm. I, w- I didn't want to tell her. Wow. Um, I didn't bring her to the funeral. I just thought, if she's only it's five, but she really needs it, yeah. Do you think it's age because appropriate then? Do you think, depending on the age they are, they're... Uh, and, and as parents, we can be better equipped as well you know we should be better equipped because i i I understand how you feel you know that question where are they gone if you're if you're not religious um is a very tricky one to answer it's very very tricky um i i would be religious myself um but i kind of i still don't have the answers for you know i give all the answers i'm supposed to give but at the same time like it could every once in a blue moon she'll start asking me questions again uh, so I know it's playing on her mind <laughs> okay. and at five years of age like I can't even satisfy I, my, my mother looks after her after school some days and she obviously she said to me one day will you mind my children when you're old <laughs> and, I'm, and I have children and I'm like yeah and she said and then I said I'm sure when I'm gone then um, you'll look, look after your grandchildren <laughs> and she started <laughs> crying Oh. And I was like, what's that? She said, I don't want you to go. Oh, my days. Well, I said, be really old. <laughs> I suppo- well, I suppose in, in terms of um, normalising it and, and uh, having a part of the curriculum, it, it might... It might help it, as well. Definitely help, part yeah. of the conversation. Yeah, listen to this. I just got a text in Lorraine saying, Hi, Jen and the 2FM team. My kids lost their nan when they were five and seven, similar to your kid. Um, they were at the removal and funeral, but I didn't let my daughter go see the coffin as I was afraid she might touch her nan, my mum. They were very close to their nan. I think they needed to go through the process, though. They put a picture of uh, them in the coffin and scratch cards. They didn't put... Uh, stuff in the coffin but they wanted to send something off with her I got a book listen to this I miss you a first look at death so there is stuff out there afterwards to read to talk about losing a loved one it's a very tough time but I found this book really really helpful I miss you a first look at death Um, yeah I suppose as parents we need to try and be better equipped and I think it's okay to go nobody knows you know, no, yeah. nobody knows the answer to that. Uh, you know, uh, I know, but at, at five years of age, they, they need an answer. Oh, they want the answers. <laughs> they certainly do. Definitely um, do. Would no, you I mean? know. Years ago, when my own grandmother passed away, and my other, my older two children were only three and five, I didn't bring them anywhere near it. Um, they they could see at home how upset I was. I was very close to my grandmother, but I didn't I didn't bring them to any part of the funeral. And there, there was, I don't know, are they just different children or what? But they didn't even ask questions. So you know, compared to my five-year-old now, she's all questions. But and do you I think, think your five-year-old... technology yeah. and YouTube and she's seeing more and she knows more mm. than what the other two did, I just, I don't know. <laughs> well, would you be inclined to get that book, I Miss You, A First Look at Death for your five-year-old? Definitely. Yeah, that might yeah, help as well. Like it might help, yeah. Um, she sounds like a very inquisitive little girl. Oh, very, very. <laughs> like, she was sitting on my lap one night watching uh, A Dog's Journey. And at the end of the movie, the grandfather is dying in it. And she said to me, why, why are they all sad? And I said, the grandfather is dying. I thought not now that nobody had died belonged to her at that stage. And next thing I saw the hen come up. And then I saw the other hen come up. And I looked around at her and she was born. Aww. <laughs> and I said, what's wrong? And she said, that's so sad. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, I, I think trying to answer your questions and, and getting books and getting the help and going through it as a process will, will definitely help her. Um, yeah. and it depends on the kid, doesn't it, really? Some kids. Oh, 100%. Uh, everybody's, you know, everybody's kid is, is going to be completely different. Uh, Lorraine, yeah. thanks for getting in touch with the show. Best no of luck bother. with your young one. Um, there we go. Keep your text coming into 51552. We're going to take a quick break. And I have some news. It's very exciting. Don't go anywhere.
five, you're saying. David, you just won five grand. Yes! Congratulations, David. You have finally won Money Monday. It's been won, everybody. Be in the now. With Tracy Clifford. Weekdays from 12. On RTE 2 FM. Try and figure out who that person is. Are you ready? Here's what it says. Have a listen to this. I'm writing to you today because I think you're an absolute inspiration to everyone in this country. Your fighting spirit is second to none. Mm -hmm. If you know who that is, text me now on 51552 with your answer and your name. As always, RT competition terms and conditions apply. You can see 2fm.ie for all the details. And if you're not sure who it is, don't panic because we're going to tell you what else is written on the card a little later on in the show. So you'll get another clue. 2FM. Entertainment News. Yes, here she is, Miss Lolly Ryan with the Entertainment News. So What's happening? poor old Lewis Capaldi, he's revealed he's been struck down with a bad case of bronchitis. Okay. So he says he's absolutely devastated because the consequence is he's been forced to postpone two of his shows. So Zurich and Milan. And it's actually a really big deal. I personally know quite a few people who wanted to go and see him. So book tickets and made a holiday out of it. Uh-oh. So it's not great news. But he was told by a voice specialist that he needs vocal rest for at least three days. So he put up a statement on Twitter and it said, I am absolutely devastated to be typing this. Lots of you know for the past few nights of the tour, I've been really struggling with my voice. Like last night in Stockholm, I really tried my best to sing through the show, even though it was very uncomfortable because I was desperate not to let anybody down. Now the good news is he has already rescheduled the shows. So the Zurich show will be now on June 28th and his Milan gig is going to be on May 31st. All the original tickets are still valid so there's no need to worry about that and he wants